for you what's the outcome. Okay, so I'm recording. Um, so just so you know, it's it's recording now. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I'll share. Right, that's gonna be the best, I guess. Yeah. Uh, uno momento. Un momento. Hola, a ver. Hi. Can you see a empty browser window? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so just to give a context for others, um, we have this um, async API React component that is a yeah, React component for rendering async API. And it supports 1.0. We want it, of course, to support 2.0. Um, and it's yeah, one of the use cases for this component is, of course, to work on the client-side applications, not only server-side applications. So um, we need to have a, a parser um, to support rendering um, and for now as you know there's only go parser so we wanted to check out uh, WebAssembly how we could um, because it's really mature at the moment and we wanted to check how much go is mature if it comes to WebAssembly and if it really works and we can use it mm -hmm. uh, so the all the details are in this issue um, but I think the most important is what Marcin uh, from our Kima project did. He created a really simple example. Uh, repository is also linked into the into the issue. Uh, what he did, he simply provided really simple instructions how to set up an Nginx um, hosting the um, the WebAssembly um, file, and then use it to showcase that it's uh, really working, that you can really parse and as an API spec in the UI. Uh, so just to show you quickly, um, I have it running um, uh, with Docker. And the, the main outcome of the POC is that um, Go is not much enough. The, the default Go um, compiler compiles uh, into really big size packages. So the, the Go parser for async API, the size um, of the, um, of the um, compiled file Mm -hmm. A WASM file is uh, 40 megabytes, and even if you enable, like in this showcase, we have a, um, a gzipping enabled on the server side for Nginx, even then uh, the package is 3.5 megabytes. Yeah. So even though you can nicely just take an example, put it here, and see that really parsing works. So everything, everything is realized, the parsing is realized with the Go parser for Async API. Uh, you can clearly see that having a 3.5 megabytes um, file <coughs> is yeah, rather a temporary easy. solution. Yeah. So for us, it's super cool because we can, uh, with, with this POC, we proved it works, so we can start working on the on the React component without waiting for a for other parser, so yeah. it unblocks the work. We can, yeah, we can do it. But long term, uh, yeah, I would not say Go is a a good solution for now for using in WebAssembly. Yeah. So it's just so you know, I'm hoping to have the the parser in in native JavaScript working for the browser and for Node.js. I'm hoping to have it like I don't know like probably end of this month or something like that because it's really simple you know it's well i mean we 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 already did with version one we already did like this it's just uh changing the schema to version two release candidate one and and basically it's just that there's nothing else i mean we can keep improving it but since it's javascript and it doesn't have types so Parsing is basically the a validator, <laughs> nothing else. It's just and and giving and it's giving you the the whole the raw J JSON object, right? 
So the parsing is really easy. You don't have to match uh, um, the JSON structures to data types in JavaScript, right? Because there are no data types. So, um, so yeah, it's it's really easy. So I'm I'm hoping to have it uh, ready for the um, for the end of the month, for sure after the conference or beginning of the next month because next, uh, next month because I'm taking holidays right after APA Day San Francisco, which is next week. And so, yeah, but it shouldn't be hard. Uh, it shouldn't take long, to be honest. I actually have a proof of concept on, on my machine now and with, uh, with JavaScript and it works perfectly in browser and in Node.js. I'm just not happy with the code quality, but it works. So, so yeah. Um, so and thanks. Parsing of protobuf and and no those? no no just the basics without protobuf okay. or Afro support just uh, you know the basic uh, JSON schema and that's it, um, which is enough to unblock your work right uh, as well. So um, and for more, most of the cases, it's gonna be enough. So yeah. Well, before I forget, thanks for this proof of concept with WebAssembly because that proves that, um, I mean, it's cool, it's nice, and it's, it may be there in the future, uh, but it's not there yet. I guess the problem is on, or the, the hard work is on, is on the site, on the Go compiler, right? Uh, the false yeah. of the Go compiler might have to work harder into building smaller, uh, smaller WebAssembly files and, and C++ files as well. Um, so yeah. So Rysel suggested to, to why don't we um, why don't we use Rust, right? Um, is there a special reason you want to use Rust? I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this because I remember you were in the conversation in the beginning. Yeah. That Rust, mm. uh, we, we ditched Rust because the community is not so big. And, and, and the packages that you can find in Rust are much less than even in Go, which is already a problem. Um, so switching to Rust may make the, the bundles smaller, but the developer, the, the developing harder, right? So, and so I don't know, I, I don't know if it fits really a good, good idea or, or or it's preferable to just uh, create a single a parser pair language, right? Instead of uh, having just one and, and transpile to all the languages. Um, you want to say something? Raisel, you wanted to say something? No, well, I mean, my, my thinking was um, thinking it about the limited resources of facing API. Able probably made sense to you um, if we could do what we are trying to do with, with Go, I mean, Ross does it perfectly. I mean, when you, when you compile anything from Ross to, to WebAssembly, it's ridiculous small. Yeah. Yeah, but because what about, what about this library? Have to, it doesn't have to compile any Garbus collector or yeah. anything that Golan is putting into there. That's why it's so big. But about about the community, that could be an issue. Uh, yeah, so I remember. My, I, yeah. my concern is, for instance, I mean, Ruben can tell you better because he's he's been fighting against uh, the dollar ref. You know, resolving all the all these dollar refs in the spec and going to the remote file, downloading it, parsing it. You know, and Put it into the into the spec. Uh, in Go, it's been already a, <laughs> a problem. Like <laughs> he's been doing a proof of concept, uh, but it's really tricky. And in JavaScript, you already have it. You have you already have libraries that that does that, right? But um, and then, for instance, you have libraries that may convert from Avro, if I remember correctly. Um, from Avro to JSON schema or the other way around, I don't remember. Um, so there, there's, there's something in Go, at least there's something, right? But I, I don't know about Rust. I mean, the, the thing, whenever I try to find something uh, with Rust, like support for protobuffers or for Avro 
or for JSON schema, for instance, uh, the support is really, uh, <laughs> you know, it's in the early days or, or, or inexistent, basically. So it's hard to, it's hard, to, it's hard for that reason. We could, I mean, anyone could argue that if we create it for this project, then we contribute to the community, right? So uh, we contribute to, 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 to have it, basically. But that's like a huge workaround, right? <laughs> that would be amazing. Over, the, the, over time, that would be amazing. But uh, speaking the other day with, I um, don't remember who, but I was speaking to someone <laughs> about the parser. And, and I realized there's a, another problem. We haven't think, I, I think it was with you, Abel. Um, with uh, there's another problem with the parser and it's like if we're gonna make it uh pluggable so we want to plug a parser for protobuf and 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 for extensions and all this stuff if you write the extension for instance in javascript and the parser is in go how do you use a javascript extension with a go parser uh or I mean, one could could say, it. yeah, but you you use the JavaScript uh, the JavaScript parser, not the Go parser. But you may be using the parser in your Go code, so you can do that. You cannot do that. So um, that takes us to a point that maybe the only way to go is to create a parser for each language, <laughs> you know, and repeat the job in each language and maintain all the packages. All the parsers for for every language, so becoming native in in every language, right? Which is scary because it's it's a huge work. I'm sure we can do some kind of boilerplate or or, or automation around it, but ultimately we have to we need to have if we if we want to make things pluggable, uh, we need to have. Um, uh, a parser on, on each language, right? So um, you'll get what I'm saying, like, uh, do you understand or, or am I just uh, throwing ideas and doesn't make sense? If someone doesn't understand what I'm talking about, just uh, please raise your hand and I'm, I'm happy to. Okay, so, <laughs> so uh, I will say, uh, so before I continue, Lucas, what is that that you don't understand? I was already lost with why would I even bother that I want to use my JS extension in a Go parser? Yeah, so, even a... so imagine that, that you, you have uh, an extension that parses a Twitter account, for instance, like the one on the examples that we have. Um, and you want to use, and this extension, this parser of the extension is written in JavaScript but you're using the Go parser for your project or a Java parser or whatever, right? And you want to tell the Java parser, hey, use this extension for the Twitter account, but you can't on the code because it's, it's not Go code or it's not Java code, it's JavaScript code. So how do you plug it to, a, to another type of language? You know what I mean? So imagine that you have, you have to pass in a call, in a call to the parse method you you want to pass at the at the end of the of the of the method you want to pass an array of parsers of uh, extension parsers right uh, or extension validators if you want not parsers um, how do you pass there uh, a code in another language you know what I mean it's impossible right now so Does that mean that you you want to create a plugin system that will work in many languages? Yeah, but because the thing is, the, the, the support for protobuffers, Avro, you know, and other, and other schemas, uh, schema languages like XSD for XML, the idea is to make all of them pluggable because there are other, there are other um, internal uh, and, and, and and, and external as well, uh, languages or schema formats that we're not going to support natively in each language, right? Because that will be insane. So imagine that, for instance, I, I use the, the example of flat buffers, for instance. Flat buffers is, is really, um, 
it's highly adopted in, in the game industry, right? So what happens is if, if we don't add support for flat buffers, they have to create a flat buffer uh, message parser. They, the, the idea of the parser was that, like, okay, you create a flat buffer message parser and you plug it into our parser. But if someone wrote it on JavaScript, the flat buffer uh, parser, you cannot plug it into the Go parser or into the Java parser or into the Python parser. You can only plug it into the JavaScript parser. <laughs> and you may not be running your code in JavaScript. You may be running it in Java or Python or whatever. So that creates an inconsistency and impossibility to have uh, all these parsers in a single, in, in every language, unless you repeat the work in every language. Um, in any case, that um, the thing is that this situation remains the same if someone, if we create a parser for each language and someone has it on JavaScript only, uh, it's the same problem, right? So I'm not sure how to proceed with that, to be honest. Like, uh, if we still have just a single one um, in Go, for instance, or in another language, and then compile to many languages <coughs> or, or not. I mean, the thing, I don't know, to be honest, is it's, it's, it's a hard uh, decision because in any case, what I'm seeing here is that we can probably not make the parser pliable. Maybe, and extensible. So, which is, I mean, it's fine, but it loses a lot of power, right? Like. <laughs> Like since the the, the first uh, the first idea of the of the parser was to make it pluggable, um, so it's easily extendable. Um, or maybe we can help other people. I don't know. Write their extensions in in a language that can be compiled down to other many languages. Like I don't know, like in Go or in Rust or uh, something else. Um, so is it more or less clear now the concern with this? More or less? Yeah, maybe I just simply didn't get it at first because for me it's, I would not consider it as a concern, right? Because at the end, if you just have, let's say, Go parser and JavaScript parser, and they're all prepared in the way that you can plug in your custom code into it, and then somebody is, having everything in Java and they have some um, parser for some specific uh, protocol written in Java, then, I mean, what else can you do? You simply have to tell them, write it in the in language, language. That, yeah, exactly. in another language, or just write your own Java parser, or simply let's work together on providing another parser and that, that's it. Yeah. I, mean, you can't, I don't think you can satisfy everyone. Yeah, no, I know, I know. I'm just uh, trying to, I'm, I'm putting all the examples, you know, all the situations and scenarios. So we pick one, you know, and we make sure that we pick one wisely before continuing work on that, right? Um, so yeah, I guess maybe in that case, I'm, I'm just thinking aloud, maybe just in, in, in this case, you have to just, uh, uh, yeah, so the, the parser is pluggable, but you only can plug code in your own language, obviously, right? And not all the extensions are going to be available in all languages like, like the parser, right? Mm. Okay. Okay. So in, in any case, coming back to the, to, to the topic of using Rust, um, yeah, yeah. Problem is uh, it, it will slow down development. So, starting because starting from the the fact that none of us know Rust, but some of us do know Go. So, so yeah, uh, I'll stick to Go and just create a, a separate parser for JavaScript, which is a like a special case because of the browser, right? Um, I don't know. Over time, maybe uh, we get. Uh, we get some news from the Go folks and they improve the compilation process. 
and we can get rid of the other one. Who knows? And and there is already a tiny gut tiny goal um, project, uh, which is a yeah a separate a different compiler that the community works about on uh, to make Go embeddable in uh, with these tiny devices. Nice. Um, but it's yeah, um, we tried it with uh, this Go parser for um, async API, so the generated WebAssembly file did not fully work worked because not everything is yet fully supported there. But maybe even in in few months, um, the story will be totally different with WebAssembly mm -hmm. for Go. Okay, so to be realistic and move forward and not blocking anyone, uh, most of our tooling is written in JavaScript. Uh, right now in Node.js, and uh, when I when I say most of our tooling, I mean the Sync API tooling, right? Not uh, not the code in your companies, um, but most of our tooling is for generating documentation or generating code and all this stuff. So it doesn't really matter if you don't have a parser for Java, for instance, uh, in the beginning. Right, because the code will be generated using the Node.js parser or the JavaScript parser will be gener generating Java code that you can use later. So, so it's still it's still fine, right? Um, and what else? You also had something, Lucas. Yeah, yeah, so we uh, it's about the converter and the service. So just I wanted to align. Uh, how we should proceed with that. So we, uh, for our use case for Kima, we need um, not only, we're not only building front end, but also we need a back end for that uh, will validate this pack and, and convert it uh, for the customers from old version into the new one. And the whole stack uh, for us, uh, we, it always is Go length. So we need to provide a, uh, we know that you have this Node.js converter, uh, but we need a Go one, and we will. Uh, so we will work on the converter. Uh, we actually start this week, mm -hmm. and and we will also work on a service uh, that will be a REST service with two endpoints. That one will be avail um, responsible for validation, uh, and the other one will be, of course, responsible for um, for conversion. So you will provide a spec, and then in return you're going to get a converted uh, version and my question would be because for us um, I think that the best would be if it goes like with the async um, um, async API react component into the async API uh, organization but it's up to you to decide if you prefer it that we contribute to your organization or we keep it in Kima because if we will keep it in Kima it means it's going to end up in our huge monorepo somewhere hidden between the components so nobody will really know about it. So let's, let's, let's proceed as what we did with the uh, React component. Uh, same thing. We, okay, then we just need a repo for that. Huh? Then, so then we just need a repo, so we need to create a repo for yeah, a converter. I think you should be able to create repos if I'm not mistaken. I think oh. so. Yeah, you have the power. <laughs> I have the power. Yeah, because remember that you, you were able to add uh, some other people to the org from Kima and all stuff, remember? So, but I'm, I don't think I'm able to actually add to the org because no. I wanted to add one person recently and I could not. Okay, and, and we'll figure out later. No, no, no yeah. worries. Yeah. So, uh, does anyone wanted to raise some topic or some questions? Not really? Okay. So uh, before uh, I continue, so I would like to, to welcome to the group uh, Abel. Thank Abel. you. Hi. Hi, all. You, uh, <coughs> you want to introduce yourself, maybe? I'm going to make you speak in English. <laughs> Great. Well, I'm Abel. I am from Madrid, <clears throat> I'm from Spain. And uh, well, I met uh, with uh, Ruben, and uh, he put me in contact with uh, Fran and this uh, this project. Uh, I spent the last two years um, defending the the uh, C APIs because I was working for a 
media company and uh, uh, the only way that I found to solve uh, some issues, some big issues was the, in the async way. And uh, I'm really excited about this, uh, this project because I think that, uh, it has a very long uh, road to um, a very, it will be a very interesting uh, way to solve uh, most of the most issues that uh, a lot of companies are already having with the big data and things like that. So I can contribute with uh, documentation with, um, I, during this week I was trying to make uh, an implementation of uh, GraphQL with the, with the subscribe uh, action and, and deploy it, well, implemented uh, with the async API uh, specs. And I'm just, for now I'm just uh, playing with the, the, the editor, the online editor. I'm trying, I'm using an example about um, car renting and I'm trying to, nice. to make it uh, work with the front end. Uh, and the front end I'm doing with uh, Angular is the most uh, uh, language that, uh, is the language that I really know, so. Is it something that you can share afterwards? No, not yet. Not really, not afterwards, when you, when you finish it, you can share. Ah, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. Okay, um, that, that would be amazing. The like, meaning you know, is, to, is to write something for, for the blog, you know? So yeah, something, that, something that I was thinking, and then some people, or many people are asking, is about use cases and examples, right? So we're lacking a lot of examples, and, and useful examples, not the, the one, you know, the ones mm -hmm. uh, that we have in the report right now. Uh, but the useful as in, you know, representing uh, cool big real, real use cases. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so that that will be really amazing. So welcome, Abel. Uh, I hope you we have you, we have you for longer here, um, and yeah. So um, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, I started another meeting. And that's why there was a lot of confusion in the in the beginning, um, which is for people who want to regularly contribute to Async API. Because this one is a public meeting uh, for people who just want to attend, maybe ask some questions, and because they have some, they have interest. Um, and I created another one for contributors. So we keep up. Uh, we first of all we know each other, and 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 we can uh, share the progress or questions about the development of of certain features, right? So. Um, if anyone wants to, to be in, uh, just let me know and I'll send an invite, okay? But remember that this one, which is, by the way, happening at the same time of this one, every, it's gonna be every Tuesday. Um, this one is gonna be about development. It's not gonna be about uh, like this one, which is usually to expose to the public or to answer questions to people that might join and don't join uh, anymore because they don't really care so much about the development of the project, they're just curious, right? So, so yeah, just uh, so you know. And I was thinking on doing some issue review, but uh, what do you think? Uh, maybe it's too late or, or, or um, because, we just we just have 20, 20 minutes to go. Um, there were some people picking some issues last uh, on the last meeting two weeks ago, so maybe it would be nice to have some feedback from you on how it's going. If if you if you started doing something, I don't know because uh, I know that some people couldn't work yet, but. Uh, But I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I would like to, to know uh, from you. So, for instance, I, I know I, I've seen that Lucas, you've been working on the on this. Yeah, there was this, this, there was this bug with the um, resolving references to fives, as far as I remember. Mm, um, I mean, I mean another one. Which one are you talking about? I, I mean, this installation won't work with version zero point seven and app. It's assigned to you. 
Ah, uh, yeah, but it's this one that is dependent on the NFF, no, node IFF, EFF. This one is uh, right. that we discussed that we yeah, yeah, are yeah. blocked waiting for them to enable support for node 12. You're right. So I, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna move it to to the icebox. <laughs> okay. That will not that will not be an issue anymore when we have the JS the native JS part. Of it, so. Yeah, but the, the pull request on the node on this dependency, I I saw that one person already approved it. Uh, yeah. They just probably need to fix failing CI and yeah, maybe soon they will enable support for the latest node. Nice. Get to know <laughs> as well, yeah. But that was one ticket, and the other one I had was the failing um, in the in the uh, generator repo. There was a issue filed that you cannot generate uh, yeah. markdown if you have references to files, and sure. I only uh, made it made it possible to kind of set up an environment where I can reproduce it. Okay. But didn't yet work on the fix because I first wanted to set up a goals for this converter and the and the service. That's but totally yeah, I continue working on it. <laughs> totally fine. Um, and then Ruben, I know you have many things in progress. I'm I'm curious if it, this is true because you will be crazy. You will become crazy if you have too many things in progress. <laughs> Well, uh, actually, I was working in the same back as uh, Lucas, I think, or if it's, I, it seems to be related at least. Maybe it was a duplicated back, uh, and maybe. then, and then I was uh, also deprecating the node code gen and adding to the to the generator, but okay. I haven't finished. I mean. So maybe so maybe you can both coordinate uh, because I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so let's let's think offline to see. Yeah. What we're the same, yeah? You yeah. can synchronize, yeah, maybe. And also, I have the Abro examples yeah. that I'm working on. I mean, yeah. But are you working on it, or you or you have it like uh, someday I'll I'll work on it. No, no. So I I'm working on it, like really slow and really. Okay. Few, but yeah. okay, okay. No, just I just want to know because in case you you're blocked or something or you're not in the mood or whatever, we we'll put it back and someone will pick it. So, and yeah. if you have code already uh, and you want to share it, just share it. Uh, I think. Yeah, I mean, actually, the the Abro parser it's working for simple cases, but I wanted to test it with uh, more real examples, and that's what I'm working on. Okay. So, so then, yeah. So maybe if if you want to to share, just push this code to a branch, so right. we can start. Uh, I mean, helping maybe not just uh, reviewing, but maybe we can just uh, uh, synchronize and say, hey, I have some fixes for this case, this case, and this other case, and and we can we can all contribute, right? Or maybe okay. just create a draft uh, pull request now that GitHub uh, has this. Yeah. Draft. Uh, you know, just yeah. make it clear that this is a draft, that this is this is just yeah. a shitty code, maybe. Because um, <laughs> I know you, and it's going to be shitty code. So. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> Not like mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, Abra. Oh, man, no. <laughs> mine is really bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I'll push the changes then. Okay, perfect. Thanks, man. So, um, what else? Ah, you had more. Uh, you had this can't refer to a key that has a dot in it. Yeah, I mean, that's... It, it was fixed, maybe. Uh, I'm not sure, because... Let me see. My log on, uh, I think... Yeah, I'm seeing I'm I'm seeing a duplicated issue here. There is another one called reference to local file doesn't work. Exactly. Yeah, and it's the same as a uh, oh crap, it's the same as a Lucas one. I think that the dot thing it's done. 
I think it's good uh, by a pull request from someone. Yeah, from the Russian guy. Yeah. I think. Uh, I mean, we can try quickly. Maybe. Say so if, if we have something like this. Does it work? I think I broke the playground. <laughs> no. It, okay. it could happen. <laughs> yes. No, but it doesn't work. I don't know why. It's, it doesn't work, but it doesn't fail. It's really strange. I'm, I'm trying, I'm playing on the playground and it doesn't update, but it doesn't break or it doesn't show any error or anything. It just ah yeah yeah it it uh, it it works yeah 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 cool so yeah so it's not an issue anymore so we can the dot one no yeah so I'm gonna move it down and probably close it and that's it okay And what else? What else? What else? I think that's it, right? And I don't know if you remember that we talked about the the reference to a local file, but the file was a YAML file, not a JSON file. Ah, yeah. Because that that was that's one issue. Maybe. Yeah. We can discuss it here with. That, that that's a thing that we have to consider. Um, so, for instance, I, I know, or I think I know, in the, in the Open API case, if you reference a YAML file, it's not going to work. You have to reference only JSON files. So, so you can have the spec, your spec can be in YAML, but uh, reference files, Cannot be in YAML. It has been in JSON. Yes, yeah, but there's that bug that it doesn't work referencing a file. It's because the file is in YAML. Exactly. It, exactly. <laughs> so in this case, <laughs> so but okay. if it's, if it's the a, one that I took, uh, it was that problem. So okay. So if it's JSON and it's a local file, does it work? Yeah. When it's JSON. Well, I'm quite sure, but I will double check. But there is a test. Okay. Just with that example, so. Okay. So the, so the thing is that when you have a dollar ref and then pointing to a local file or a remote file, whatever, um, and it's a YAML one, the one that's on the ref, the question is, should it work or not? Because it might seem, if, if your document is in YAML and references another YAML, the feeling is like, it will work, right? It's referencing another piece of YAML that will should be converted to JSON and then, uh, you know, and, and, and evaluated as JSON as, as we do with the, with the document. But then thinking about it, it's like, mm, I don't know, because we have these schema formats in, in version two uh, and we're expecting, we are expecting JSON schema and JSON schema is not YAML, it's JSON. So, I don't know, maybe we can, we should allow this, but only if you specify in the schema format that you expect in JSON schema plus YAML, you know, in the, in the, um, in the meme type that you can specify with a plus, you can specify the, the, the content type or something like this. I don't know. Um, does it make sense what, I, what I'm saying uh, to all of you? Like, are you getting what I'm saying, or or shall I share my screen maybe and in, in so an example? So it it makes sense, but then there would be some some default, right? So that you don't specify. 
Um, exactly. So, um, yeah, okay. And, and the issue that is assigned to me, there's the reverse situation. Um, so the file is in YAML and it references the JSON. Yeah, that should work. Because yeah. in the end, uh, even, even though if you use YAML, um, internally what happens is that, is that we use JSON. And in the spec, it says that you can use YAML, but only the subset that can be converted to JSON. So it's, it's like a nice, it's like a sugar, <laughs> you know, syntax sugar for, uh, for async API. But the real, uh, let's say, official format of async API is not YAML, it's JSON. Um, we just uh, use YAML for ease of reading for people, right, for humans. Um, but yeah, that, so I don't know. What do you think it, it, it should happen in this case? If you reference a YAML file, should it be converted or should it just don't work? Like it should work only with JSON or it should work with, if you specify another schema format. Let me share the screen. Screen. For me, the easiest would be if it would work out of, out of the box, right? So you have a JSON async API file, you reference the YAML file, and it just works. You don't have to really guess that you have to specify some different type or that so would be the best. Right? You see the, the playground, right? Yeah. So, okay, so let's remove this. So the thing is, for instance, I have this. I have this channel here. Let's make it simple. Right, and I have the message here. And this ref, imagine that this ref is pointing to a YAML file. Whatever, not here, okay, but. iApp.com, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So, strictly, can, I mean, not this one, sorry. Strictly considering the case, that should not work. That should not work, right? Because that's YAML and we work with JSON. But given that we're using YAML, referencing another YAML seems to make sense, right? Then the thing is, we could then make it explicit and have something like this. Uh, application, I think it's JSON schema, whatever. If we, if it doesn't exist, we invent it. Uh, plus YAML, whatever. So in this case, we're saying that we expect JSON schema in YAML format. So if we, there are two cases. We either make the, the, the parser detect the format and convert it to JSON automatically, or we make people have to specify this. Otherwise, it, won't, it will not work. So this one is like more, um, I don't know how to say it. So it's more like um, strict, right? Um, unless you specify it um, correctly, right? It, it, it will not work. Uh, okay, so, yeah. So, when you send me the correct content type, thanks, man. So, it will be something like this, right? Um, that will work. <laughs> right, that could work. that could be like okay. So we expect that the schema format of this reference, this payload, is going to be YAML. So then the, the the parser could react to this and say, okay, I expect YAML. I know what to expect. Or we can make it automatic. What do you think? Well, I think that people expect that the um, YAML is a superset of JSON. So, uh, if it works with uh, the parser works with YAML, it should be work yeah. uh, with JSON. So, if we have the ability, the capability to read YAML, 
I think JSON is already done. So I think that the, the property of uh, scheme format is not needed if you are going to refer. To mm -hmm. Makes sense. Okay. No, I'm just curious. I mean, I, I have my own my own opinion on that. I, I, I think I think the same. I think that um, we should make it automatic uh, instead of explicit. But then on the other side, I have the, the, the you know, <laughs> the feeling that this is a spec. Everything should be specified, right? Every case will be specified. Um, and I mean, we can put this in the specification as well. Like if your, if your reference file is a YAML, uh, parsers should convert it to JSON, whatever. We can add it in the, in the spec and that's it. Um, but maybe it's um, a possibility to add more uh, language to this um, description. I mean, for example, using proto, proto buffers or yeah, exactly. So, so the idea is when when it's a proto buff uh, format, for instance, maybe you have uh, I think it's proto or something like this, mm -hmm. right? So imagine something like this. Yeah. Right. So in this case, <coughs> you have to. You know, you have to specify this, otherwise mm -hmm. this format can be anything, right? We can we cannot be magical auto detecting everything, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> because there might there may be the case where two formats uh, are compatible between each other and two files may look like two form different formats and you don't know which one to choose. Mm -hmm. Like uh, I'm thinking for instance on Avro Avro and JSON schema uh, some pieces are very similar, both are JSON. Uh, you may have a, a, a small piece of Avro that uh, if, if, you, if you do it in JSON schema, it will be the same. So mm -hmm. then the parser will think this is JSON schema, not Avro. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. so I don't know. Um, what do you think, Andrew, about it? Yeah, I guess you need more specificity because, uh, well, in this example, you could have different versions of uh, protocol buffers, mm -hmm. and it'd be kind of nice to specify which version of protocol buffer you expect. Yeah, and in the case of YAML, the, the one that uh, we called before, like this one, do you think it should be auto-converted to, to JSON or? Uh, yeah, if you specify the the schema format, then it should be automatically converted to the uh, JSON representation. Mm -hmm. So you mean like this, it will work, right? Even if it's a YAML file, it will work. <laughs> Are there any Actually, questions? I mean, you, you could support both. You could if it's uh, in the case of YAML, it could work like this, but also you can support specifying the schema for No, no, for sure, for sure. I mean, that specifying it is, is like, uh, it's like a, um, adding more specificity. So this is like, if, if you add schema format, for sure, you're making it clear, this is YAML, so the parsers will not have any problem parsing it, right? Actually, and you can you can have like a table with each file extension and the uh, default uh, schema format mm -hmm. specification for each file extension. So well, we actually don't look at the name of uh, the file name. We look at the uh, at the content. The content. Because imagine it's a URL and it doesn't have the .yaml. Uh, it might happen. So, but or wait. YAML or YML. <laughs> you look yeah, at the uh, is that. Imagine that it's a URL. In a URL, you don't need to put the dot whatever in the yeah. end. I mean, in yeah. files either. So, <laughs> and Do you look at the MIME type? Huh? Do you look at the MIME type? The uh, HTTP uh, MIME type? I guess there's there's a MIME type header, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Do, do you look exactly. at that header? This could be inferred from the, in, in the case of HTTP, this could be inferred from the MIME type. Um, but in the case of a file, for instance, a local file, you don't have this, right? Imagine that you have my system, whatever, my stuff. <laughs> and then you have, uh, I don't know, 
um, file.yaml or you just have file and this file is a YAML file um, to work in the way, right? Uh, by sniffing the content and trying to parse the content and if it works with YAML, we assume this is YAML, right? Um, you know what I mean? So using like magic uh, bits to determine the uh, it a best effort, like say, <laughs> huh? we, we try YAML and if it's not YAML, exactly, not JSON, we just explode and exactly. So currently, what we're doing is we try to parse the the content as JSON. If it doesn't work, we then try as YAML. If it doesn't work, it's neither JSON or YAML, so we fail. We we rest an error, but. The more stuff that we add, or not the more stuff, because this is only for the case of the default where we don't have the schema format, right? Uh, we only consider those two. Um, so I was thinking that, I don't know, maybe. So if you have, plug so if you have plugins, that have, as you add each additional plugin, you have to check a, 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 an additional format. For, for if you have plugin format plugins yeah so 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 the idea the idea of this is that the default which is like this without schema format right the default will will only support json and yaml and if you want to support something else you need to explicitly specify the schema format otherwise it will not work but we're talking now about the default like you don't specify anything, what do we assume? Is this JSON? Is this YAML? <laughs> Is it, we don't care? <laughs> like, you know, it's a, we try both. Um, there's a, by the way, there's another, I'm considering another change in the spec for the final version, which is something like this, right? instead of schema format, you'll have something like this. So this becomes mandatory all the time. The schema format becomes mandatory all the time. You cannot, you, we, we will not have a default because you have to put it. Why is this? Because some people are asking for multiple formats like this. I want to have the, um, Imagine I, I want to have my I want to have my message defined in JSON schema and XSD and one will think why you want to define it in two different formats, right? That's what I thought in the beginning and that's why I chose for the, the, the other way of specifying it. But then someone told me, you know what's what happens in old in, in old applications with the legacy code, what happens is that you're migrating from XML, for instance, to uh, JSON, okay? So you will share this file uh, for, uh, for two applications, for instance, for the, the, the old and the new, or not this file, this definition, for the old and the new, right? So what happens is that you want to have both. The, the, the old application will just uh, read this one, and the new application will read this one. Um, I don't know, maybe, I'm, I'm still considering it because I think it's kind of a huge edge case. And in this case, you can have just two async API files where you just have one or the other, but not both. Because, I don't know, there's really, that really complicates a lot and makes the, the spec harder to read and to write as well. Because, I don't know, flat buffers, for instance, or open API, for instance. Uh, uh, open API, I think they have a MIME type, but I'm not sure if it's official already or not. So you might use some format here that doesn't have a MIME type. <laughs> so what do you write here? <laughs> you know, so, and then all the things like, this will work or not? So this work, um, sorry, draft 07, friends. So this work, so this work without the zero, uh, <laughs> you know, 
then we uh, and what happens if we accept JSON schema? Which draft is it? Is the seven? Is the eight? Is the four? Is it, you know what I mean? So this creates a lot of problems as well uh, by itself. I'm just uh, I'm just uh, thinking aloud, so so you all know. So um, I don't know. Shouldn't these be under different channels though? You should have like an action slash XML slash street light ID. Uh, it, might be, it might not be possible because the channel, imagine it's a Kafka topic. You only have one Kafka topic, right? Um, and you, you may receive the, 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 the data in JSON, but you have it defined in, in, or in, in, in XML, but you have it defined in both XML and, and XSD and JSON schema. So this is, again, this is not the, the, the content of the message. This is uh, uh, the definition of the content. So you can define JSON using XSD and you can define XML using JSON schema. You could, <laughs> theoretically, you can do it. So, <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, I don't think, um, I mean, I just wanted to know your opinion, you know, because, um, this is, uh, I think we're entering like, you know, uh, dark uh, areas where <laughs> we may be th uh, complicating things a lot for nothing or for some edge cases that some people have. I only heard about this once from someone, not twice. So maybe it's just a, uh, an edge case this person is having and, and that's it and there there are workarounds for this as well like i said you can have two files two async api files while you are migrating legacy code to, to new code right um i don't know so it's for me it sounds like super nice concept for async api 3.0 exactly <laughs> <laughs> exactly or even four, <laughs> or, or even never. <laughs> but yeah, uh, cool. So let me stop sharing. Cool. So I'm gonna stop uh, recording so we can start saying nice things to each other. Um,